Okay, great. So I'm just gonna, for the very beginning, I'm gonna move down to this one. And I'm gonna tell a couple of short stories just before we go on. Um, and Steve, I'm just gonna ask you a question. My toolbar at the very bottom is flashing. Do you know what that means? Yeah, that just means uh, somebody asked a question in the Q&A box. So until we uh, answer that, and it looks like someone's, someone had just shared a link on a related topic. So I'm gonna dismiss that. People can see that in the dismissed column of their Q&A box. Um, but as questions come in, that'll flash for you. Um, okay, so you can, great. Yep. Good to, good to understand that, thank you. Yep. Okay, so um, I guess the first couple of things I just wanna talk about is um, I'm just gonna share my experience. You know, there's, there's a lot of ways to present information and if it sounds like I'm presenting facts, um, I don't really mean to, I just present it with some confidence because I, I you know, lived through it and experienced it and such. Um, but uh, I'm really not presenting facts, I'm more, uh, presenting experiences and they may sound like facts but in the end that that's really all they are it's just you know what I found kicking around out in my pastures um, so that's that's the first part the second part is um, you know we we like to talk to experts everybody when we have questions we go and talk to an expert and I've heard it said that an expert is just uh, an individual who has made all mistakes possible in a narrow field uh, and I, I really love that definition of expert. If, if that's the definition, then I don't know if I've made all the mistakes, but I, I hope I've made enough that I can share some of them and that'll keep some other people out of trouble. <laughs> um, so uh, when I first started tinkering with uh, reduced grain rations was the summer of 2012. And this was before... Um, kind of before, you know, it turned off so dry, that was a terrible drought year. And while it was still green, um, I had uh, an acre that I had been using as a market garden, and I had planted most of it in field peas, just as a cover crop. And then I'd planted another section of it in turnips. Uh, so I had all that stuff growing, and as, um, as the summer got going, I had 16 certified organic pigs, and, um, and I called the feed company, and the feed company said, uh, "Wait a second, I'm gonna, I'm just gonna take a, a, a moment here and ask you a question, Steve. Steve, is there some way you can make that bottom toolbar stop flashing?" Uh, yeah, I, the the only way I can do that is by clearing the questions out of there. So I I will just I'll try and keep that clear can, for you. Sorry. Okay, hold on. Uh, yeah, no, it's okay. I'm, I'm easily distracted. Kind of like a deer in the headlights. If you can <laughs> keep, keep clearing them off so it's just not flashing yep. like sirens, that would be uh, no problem. a little bit easier for me. Okay. So anyway, um, that year we, uh, we called in our next feed order of organic grain and uh, the company said, I'm sorry, we've had a big fire. Uh, part of our packaging facility has burned down. And uh, we're not going to be able to supply you with grain for the next six weeks. And I thought, oh my goodness, what have I, what have I gotten myself into? Uh, I looked around and I tried to find other places that could supply uh, organic grain. And turns out that um, all the ones that I could find had just very expensive delivery fees, um, or the grain itself was very expensive, or or it was going to be non-organic, and I didn't want to break my certification just kind of on this little accident on somebody else's part. Um, so uh, so I, I just went for a walk, you know, and I walked around my fields and walked around my pastures and thought to myself, what a, how am I going to rectify this? And there, the beauty was there was only 16 pigs. I wasn't trying to feed 500 pigs. Um, and uh, so I walked around, and in retrospect, it seems kind of obvious, you know. Uh, we walked out and we looked at that, you know, acre of field peas, and it was beautiful soil, and the field peas were, you know, over my knee high uh, when this happened, and they were just going into flower, and just lots of body, little tiny peas on the pea vines. <clears throat> and, uh, and I thought to myself, well, golly, here's the solution. I'm just going to turn these pigs loose into this patch of field peas and see how they do. And I did that uh, for six weeks. 
and they grazed through there. I gave them some cracked chicken eggs, but very few. We gave them a little bit of cracked chicken eggs that we were selling and, um, and, uh, and some turnips. And lo and behold, at the end of six weeks, uh, the pigs had gotten larger. They were bigger. They, they weren't acting like they were dying. They weren't acting like they were starving to death. And, um, and I thought, wow, this is, this is, I really just learned something here. I, I didn't have to buy any grain. I grazed them on cover crops. Uh, bear in mind that none of this was planned. None of this was deliberate um, until the moment when I needed to. And, uh, and I thought, well, this is worth some, some math. So I sat down at my desk and I calculated out several things, you know, down to how much did I expect that they gained? Uh, how much would I have fed them in grain? Uh, what would the bill, what would the grain bill have been? What do I think they would have been projected to gain if they were just eating grain? I, anyway, I made up two different spreadsheets, weighed it all out. It turns out that the pigs had grown slower but had um, only cost a fraction of the amount. And I thought, well, that's, that's food for thought. Is this worth uh, doing again in some other fashion? Or is this worth uh, trying to duplicate but with a larger number of pigs? And, um, and it turns out that that was the first in a long series of experiments in trying to see exactly how much grass a pig can eat. So, that's our intro story. I'm going to go right back to the beginning. And whenever I give this presentation as a conference talk, um, I always talk about the Farm to Consumer Legal Defense Fund. I don't work for them or anything, but sometimes when I go to conferences, I table for them. And it's just worth knowing that they exist. If you have, uh, if you ever need help kind of uh, wading through the legal ease or the red tape of health department stuff, uh, these guys are really really know their stuff and they're you know Joel Salatin's probably their their best known uh client so anyway farm to consumer legal defense fund pretty neat deal so uh the pigs in this picture uh you the question is pasture raised versus grazing so the first thing I really like to talk about is uh pasture raised is not a synonym for grass fed. Uh, grass fed is, you know, a term that generally applies to beef, cows, and sheep. And what it amounts to is the animal just lived on grass. I mean, USDA has a whole lot of other uh, things that they allow for, sort of unfortunately, I guess. But uh, anyway, grass fed uh, should mean just living on grass and forages. Pasture raised doesn't mean that. So almost all of my pasture raised pigs are going to eat grain. Uh, this is part of our breeding sow herd, and uh, these, are, these are pretty stout ladies. They, they ate some grain in their day, and what they're doing right now is they're nibbling, they're entertaining themselves, they're filling up their tummies because, you know, uh, gestating sows, these would be gilts in this case, but um, gestating gilts do not need the full grain ration. Uh, if we do give them a full grain ration, they will become very large and will, may even have trouble uh, birthing their babies at some point. Um, so anyway, just so that's on the table, uh, pasture-raised pigs eat grain. Now, a grazing pig, you know, is not exactly a synonym. It's, uh, it's a little bit close, though. A grazing pig is expected to get a very high percentage of its diet from eating green forages. And we can decide for ourselves what very high means. I, t I think of very high as 25% or higher. Um, we've raised pigs that never ate grain, and we'll, we'll get into that in this, uh, in this talk. But, um, you know, pigs that don't eat any grain, and we'll see this later, grow fairly slowly. Just because it can be done doesn't mean that we make any money at it. So um, that's pasture raised versus grazing. Steve, have I explained that to your satisfaction? Does that make sense to you? Yeah, I understand that. If anybody okay. has a question about, sorry, I had my mic up. Um, if anybody has a question about that, they can put it in the chat box, but you, you, I understood it. Okay, great. Okay, pasture raised versus grazing. Um, 
some of the benefits of grazing. So most people have followed the grass-fed beef uh, movement. Uh, if we were to go back in time, and I mess these numbers up, you know, the specifics, the general idea is that um, in 2004, 2005, there was something like $4 million of grass-fed beef being sold every year. You know, not a lot. Um, 11 years later, it had increased by a hundredfold. All of a sudden it had gone from four, $4 million to $400 million. That was a near vertical growth curve. Uh, and you know, most of the uh, consumer preference surveys that exist uh, show if someone is willing to spend a little bit extra money on grass-fed beef, they are probably willing to spend a little bit of extra money on pasture-raised pork or chicken. Um, a lot of the same attributes apply. Uh, there's an animal welfare component. You know, many people believe that animals living on green grass are a little bit happier. I, I agree with that. There's the sustainability issues, you know, uh, the gigantic factory farms um, will probably prove to be less sustainable. No, I don't think very many people will argue that. Uh, and then the human health component. You know, um, a lot of the statistics that apply to grass-fed beef in terms of uh, human health are also going to apply slightly different uh, flavor, if you will, slightly different numbers, but pasture-raised pigs are going to have a much higher omega-3 uh, content. They'll have a lot more fat-soluble vitamins. Same thing is true of pasture-raised poultry. And all of those things should really be uh, selling points. Those should be selling points in our corner as a pasture-raised pork producer, we need to not let anybody visit our table or any restaurant buy our product um, who's, who doesn't know this. You know, they need to know how much better our product is uh, than conventional factory farm pork. Uh, they need to know um, that the animals are happy and running around in the old McDonald's farm kind of uh, format. And then they should know a little bit about our sustainability. Um, for example, uh, carbon sequestration. Um, our farm is a savory hub farm, and we're going to be using a variety of animals to continually hit the reset button uh, on grass. Most of us, I'm sure, are familiar with that idea. We allow the grass to gain a certain amount of body size, and then using either pigs, cows, or chickens, uh, we knock it back to a vegetative state. So I, I won't get off into the weeds too much on that one, but uh, every time we do that, the grass uh, or the forages is breathing in carbon dioxide and breathing out oxygen. So every time it breathes in carbon dioxide, some carbon leaves the atmosphere above our farm. We don't need any carbon over our farm. We need a lot of carbon in our farm. We need that carbon to be in the soil and it's gonna come into the soil and it's gonna eventually be organic matter. So every time that we can hit the reset button on grass, the grass is gonna be cycling carbon um, out of the sky and back into the ground uh, where it belongs. Um, I started this question, uh, the self-sufficiency piece of this slide, thinking that it would be great if I could think of some way to reduce the amount of grain coming into my farm. Uh, honestly, when I started out doing all of this, the reason was uh, mostly financial. Um, I was raising some big group of pigs. I was self-financing my grain and selling the pigs at the end when they were ripe for the picking, so to speak. And um, I wanted to figure out a way to save money. And I figured the best way to save money was to grow a, an ocean of turnips or you know acorns or get the pigs out under the oak trees or a field of alfalfa. There's gotta be some way to not uh, pay so much for grain. Um, so that's some of my motivation and some of the benefits of grazing. Move on to the tools of the trade. Uh, I'm sure everybody's pretty familiar with a lot of this stuff. Uh, for our smaller herds, uh, you can see one of the ways that we move this stuff. We have a, in the kind of mid ground, we have a barrel full of uh, step-in fence posts. We have a lot of our geared reels and that sort of thing in there. And we'd move that around and, and set up fencing. Uh, the fence in question here has two strands. And we don't need to get too deeply into the management of the animals. 
but the only time we ever use two strands is when we're weaning. So I don't remember exactly taking this picture, but by seeing the two strands that are on the post, uh, we can assume that this was a weaning pen. Uh, when we do the weaning, we, um, we bring out a livestock trailer and we get the mother pigs loaded onto the livestock trailer. The baby pigs remain in the clean, comfortable, familiar area that they've been in for the last week or 10 days. And then we cart the mothers off to be rebred. Um, and the baby pigs are comfortable there. Um, so anyway, we add a second strand to keep them from running out because a single strand, the baby will either squirm under it or squirm over it and go running off. And um, anyway, that's, that's what's going on in this picture. The third strand, if you can see kind of off to the right in the picture, um, that, pic that particular strand is getting rolled up. Um, it's not an active part of the fence. Uh, we also see these hutches. Um, everybody can see that metal hutch in the picture. Um, that particular kind of hutch, um, this picture was taken in North Missouri. I only really like those hutches uh, for big pigs in the spring and fall. And the reason is, is they are sort of, they're not insulated. They, um, are something of a not very efficient solar oven. So they radiate heat on a hot summer day. You can burn yourself touching that thing. And uh, when you see the pig on the inside panting and panting, oh, that takes an awful lot of energy. You're buying an awful lot of corn and feeding that pig so that it can pant uh, and try to keep itself cool. So um, this, I don't like this particular hutch all that well. So in terms of tools of the trade, Having a movable hutch makes a big difference um, uh, because just keeping the animals moving is going to keep them consuming something fresh, uh, if that makes sense. I, I like that the fact that this kind of hutch is movable, but at the same time, it's, um, it's not a finished product in my world. Uh, being that it's not insulated, it will get uh, painfully hot in the summer, painfully cold in the winter. It's, it's a good, uh, mild weather. It's a fair weather hutch for me. Um, also, before we leave this picture, uh, a key ingredient to understanding feeding alternative rations to pigs is, is one question. Do I bring the feed to the pig? I carry it there. I put it in a wagon. I transport the feed. The feed moves from point A to point B, point B being the pig run. That's we bring feed to the pig. Uh, the alternative to that is we walk the pig to the feed. Um, I, hope, I hope that seems clear. So uh, a grazing pig operation, and whenever I say that, don't think that that's common. It's really, really, really uncommon. Um, feeding pigs on pasture, that's great. But the actual grazing pig operation, that's, that's a fairly rare thing. So if we can look at the picture on the screen, everything on the left has been grazed. Can you see the beautiful animal impact, the very positive animal impact? Nowhere have we disturbed the subsoil. We don't see any brown, so to speak. I mean, maybe a couple of small spots. We've left uh, a diversity of plants growing. We have armor on the surface. We have not tilled the soil. Uh, animals have been integrated. It's almost like a checklist of Gabe Brown's uh, soil building stuff. Um, you can see in the middle of the screen um, how much re they respected that hot wire. They didn't get within a foot of it, uh, even though there was something to eat there. So that is a sign that your wire is hot enough. Uh, pig is a pretty smart animal, pretty sensitive to electricity. Uh, if the fence is actually just a psychological um, barrier, um, you're really, really going to want to run that thing hot. Uh, I mean hot. So you don't want them to have any question about can they jump over it. They, you want them to respect that fence. Hey, John. Uh, sir. So I was just going to say before you move on to the slide, there's a few questions I was going to feed you related to this. Me. Okay. So one of them was uh, if you have any concerns related to predation with pasture-raised pigs, and so I thought related to the uh, – the hot wire, is there, do you, do you ever worry about that back when you were in Missouri or out in Maine? Uh, I don't worry about it at all. Um, 
We, uh, in, in the ecosystems that I've lived in, um, we uh, have an inundation of coyotes and I really like coyotes. I'm a big coyote fan. Music to my ears to hear them all out there packed up and howling. Uh, we would bring the pigs up closer to the house um, to, uh, to have their babies. And that may or may not have, you know, offered us any security. We have a couple of dogs. The dogs sleep inside at night. I think that they're useless. <laughs> they provide zero benefit uh, against predation. Um, and the coyotes, um, you know, didn't bother them. Um, uh, here in Maine, uh, we have a few more bobcats and foxes. There's still coyotes here. I, I don't have any fear about those predators. I do have friends who live in places like Montana, uh, along the Gunnison River in Colorado, and they have, um, they actively see black bears. The black bears eat their sheep. Uh, they have a, you know, healthy cougar population. Um, you know, uh, they're, you know, being a savory hub, we are familiar with other savory hubs who, um, you know, are, are ranching in Africa where there are lions. And in each of those circumstances, we may have to have um, some other strategy. But uh, if there are actually bears and lions and tigers, then, you know, a six inch off the ground hot wire probably doesn't make any difference. Yeah. It probably won't, won't save the day. Uh, yeah. But, you know, in, in rural Missouri, where we had hundreds of coyotes and several bobcat, um, there'd been 14 mountain lions seen in the state in the last 10 years. Not, not very many, no mountain lion pressure. But in terms of coyotes and things like that, I, I, don't, I don't fear them in the, in the slightest uh, for my pigs. I okay. haven't had any reason to, I guess. Maybe someone else has had different experience, but nope, no sure. predation for me. Okay. Okay, and also related then uh, to fencing is, is there's a question about whether or not you've ever used electro netting or if you have any thoughts on using that versus the, you know, single strand. Yeah, you got here. Um, I use electro net netting on chickens. Uh, on pigs, I have, I, my personal experience is that it is uh, too cumbersome and expensive um, and not necessary. Um, if, uh, if a person just uses a geared reel the same way that they would uh, string a, a brake line for grass-fed beef cows, um, for everything but newly weaned pigs, I just run a single strand. And a single strand um, just under my knee, uh, running at 8,000 volts with a step-in fence post every 10 or 12 steps, um, once the pigs are well trained, I sometimes take it to 16 steps, just run that tight and run it hot and then make sure they have what they need. You know, an animal will test the fence if it feels, um, its resources are degraded. If it doesn't have enough to eat, enough shade, um, or, uh, enough water, then it will have incentive to take that hit and make an escape. But no, uh, in, in my experience, um, you know, uh, the electromagnetic, the electro, Fencing is slow and expensive and cumbersome, and um, the geared reel is fast and easy. Okay, yep. A couple more questions here related to that then. Um, what size of energizer do you recommend for, well, how much fencing do you run per pen? And then what size, it says you, you said a solar charger, but what size energizer do you recommend for that size yeah. of fencing? Um, I sometimes forget the joule count. I think joule is the way they measure these things. Yep. I use a PRS 50 and a PRS 100. Uh, both, it's just basically the same thing. This one has two batteries and one has one. That's from uh, the Premier company. I think they might be 400 bucks a piece or some, something to that effect. Uh, that's a charger. Um, it electric, electrifies the hot wire at 8,000 volts. Uh, which is what we want. We don't want it to fall below 4,000 volts. And then I use a single geared reel, um, which has 1,320 feet of braided uh, poly wire. Um, and then, you know, you've, you've charged the entire reel, whether it's on attached defense posts or still in the reel. 
So uh, from the charger's perspective, it doesn't matter if you strung it up for 20 feet or all 1,320 feet. It's, it's going to be electrifying the same thing. So that's what I do. Um, within that, I usually keep um, between 30 and 50 pigs. Um, and then we're moving them all very regularly. Okay, excellent. And I think a, a final question on the fencing here is, do you ever have any issues with that being grounded or shorted out by your um, pasture, by the grass or the forage in the field? Um, no, I don't. Um, but I have had trouble with little pieces of metal. Um, you know, our farm is an old farm, and at other points in the past, it was a sheep farm. And there are remnants of barbed wire or sheep wire just kind of apparently it's been just bulldozed into the ground and little sprigs of it stick up and and they look just like a blade of grass you know so you may find um, a very small piece of wire coming out of the ground where in 1930 there was a sheep fence and just nobody ever told me <laughs> so that will kill a battery I, I've had some great experiences killing batteries and not thinking it's shorted out and putting new batteries in and then killing those batteries and all the pigs running away. And um, that being based on not the grass load because of, you know, uh, 8,000 volts going through it on a, I think it's a three joule or 0 0.3 joule or a half joule charger. That should, that should keep it, keep it pushing. Um, but I will say just in terms of management, the way that we get grass to look like this, this is all clover. Um, in this instance, I, we baled it first and then we ran the pigs over the clover that came, you know, after first cutting was removed. We did not do a second cutting. Um, I'm, I'm less, uh, honestly, I'm less in favor of baling my own ground. Um, and I'm more in favor of grazing it with grass fed beef cows. So that's what we do now. Now we'll get a herd of grass fed beef cows. We'll run them in front of the pigs. So we'll allow all of the grass to get very big, full-bodied. Then we'll tromp it down with beef cows. Then we'll wait about three weeks. And the intention being is that a grassland ecosystem is going to have similar components to a old growth forest. Meaning that there will be canopy species, understory species, and ground cover species. So what we want the cattle to do is to remove the canopy species. When they remove the canopy species, then the understory species, which in this case is red clover, the understory species take a breath of fresh air and really explode. And so the cows um, serve two purposes. One is to remove the canopy uh, so that the clover can bloom. And honestly, pigs don't really want to eat full body, you know, high fiber grass. That, that doesn't do them a whole lot of good. This green clover that's in full flower, can you see how much they ate on the left side? They were just lawnmowers. They were like sheep. Like who knows how much red clover they ate, but they were just wolfing it down. Um, so anyway, the other thing that grazing the cattle does is it makes it so um, we don't lose the hot wire in the tall grass. You know, I, I've always daydreamed about being a cattle producer because the animal is taller than the forage that they are consuming, <laughs> right? Um, and that's what we need for the pigs to do. If we turn pigs out in, you know, four foot tall grass and the pigs are two feet tall, well, um, we won't be able to allow them to even see the hot wire. They'll escape without knowing they escaped and then won't be able to get back to their waterer. Um, so anyway, does that answer the question? Yeah, sure does. Um, and then one, one more thing before we let you move on, I, I don't want to yeah. get too derailed here because, and correct me if you're going to get to this, but i um, wondering about your brand and model of portable water waterers. Ah, yes. Okay. So um, we've tried many things with portable waterers. Uh, the most complicated being store-bought, which I don't like um, for pasture setting. Reason being is that the store-bought ones are something like a hundred gallon tank with a drinker face on one side, the drinker has a float. When the pig drinks all the water in the drinker, then the float drops, opens a valve and fills it up. Well, if you're rotationally grazing and you're moving that, that thing, um, you know, 200 yards or 100 yards every Friday morning, 
eventually you'll wreck the float arm and then you'll fill it up and uh and the float arm will be broke and you won't know it you'll fill it up it'll refill the drinker you'll walk away it'll empty the entire hundred gallons into the field <laughs> you won't know it the pigs won't have a drink don't ask me how i know that <laughs> um but anyway i don't care for those the uh, the ones that i really do like um i just get 50 gallon rubber made uh just open like kind of bathtub looking waterers just a regular old 50 gallon li uh, rubber made livestock waterer and then um i bolt a three quarter inch plywood sheet to the top in such a way that it has an opening uh, for the animals to drink on one side and then i paint it and reinforce it with two by fours on the top and then sometimes i'll actually add a couple of uh safety bars over the open end Steve, can you visualize what I'm describing? Yeah, I'm, I'm working on it. Okay, yeah. great. 50 gallon open faced waterer with a big sheet of plywood bolted on the top, mm -hmm. um, open hole on one end. And what you wanna make sure is that the smaller stock cannot on a hot day yoga their way into the hole and drown themselves. Yeah. Um, don't ask me how I know that either. <laughs> but, <laughs> Um, but anyway, uh, that's why some safety bars are important to cover that opening because if it is, if it is nearly impossible, they'll still do it. You have to make it completely impossible for them to, uh, crawl into it. Yeah. And is there, there's a quick question here about, they're not able to tip that tub over either. Is it, you know, uh, breeding stock, breeding stock can on a hot day. Mm -hmm. And um, the only way that I've found to, well, I haven't found a real good way to solve for that. We've tried all sorts of things. We've pounded T-posts into the ground and log chained the, the waterer to the T-post. They still dump it out. Um, I, I, think, I think really if, if we ever did that again, um, in those instances, we had not provided a wallow. Uh, we had provided shade, but not a wallow. I think that if they have a wallow, they won't uh, continually dump out their waterer. But that's only when the pigs get up to, you know, 350 pounds and they're, they're not gilts anymore. Now they're sows and they've learned every trick in the book to thwart the farmer. <laughs> sure. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, that, that does get through the questions here on this infrastructure stuff. So let's get okay, towards our along. grain ration diets. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. So when is grazing limited? Um, here, my short answer is for a pig, it's always limited. Um, hundred percent of the time it's going to be limited because pigs aren't ruminants. Um, so with that said, um, it is not so limited that they can't get some good out of it. So looking at this picture, the grass in that picture, um, is the, is my minimum for edibility for a pig getting a percentage of its diet. A pig can eat that. A pig can eat that. It's small. It's, you see, it's tender. It's uh, small diameter stems. There are no seed heads. Um, it's thick. There's a lot of it, a high biomass. If we were to cut a section and, and weigh it, we would see that we have a decent quantity. Um, pigs can eat that. Is it gonna take more than 5% off of your grain bill? Probably not. Uh, reason being, two reasons. Uh, one of them is there's no legumes. Uh, pigs will eat legumes like ice cream, red clover, white clover, just all kinds of that stuff. They will chow down. Uh, still won't take a, you know, 50% off your grain bill, but it'll do a lot of other good things. We'll get to those good things later. Um, the other thing is this, this looks like a monoculture to me. Um, I, I can't, you know, I'm not that great with grasses, but most of the grass I have on my place is fescue, timothy, and orchard grass. So some combination of that. But it's, um, I'm gonna guess it's, it's probably a lot of it's fescue because North Missouri is full of fescue. Um, so I just don't see a whole lot of diversity for them there. Um, I'm gonna move on. Okay, this is a great example of limited grazing. Uh, these pigs are not gonna get anything from this pasture. They're not gonna consume grass and gain weight based on the amount of grass that they consume. Now, does that mean it's not worth doing? Absolutely not. It's totally worth doing in this picture, but we have to remember that our pigs will not get uh, any measurable feed decrease 
from what they're standing on. So what will they do? Um, they will uh, deposit their droppings. Eventually, on Friday, we, we do our rotations on Friday. On Friday, when we rotate them, they will move off of a pasture that they have pooped all over. <coughs> Pardon me. They will move off of dirty ground and onto clean ground. Um, they will eat some of this, which is essentially pure fiber. There is very little in the way of nutrition on this, but they'll eat some of that, just brown sticks anyway. Those um, brown kind of weeds and you know high fiber grass, that's just like eating a lot of fiber. It's, I mean, to be at the risk of being somewhat graphic, it's gonna scrub their intestines out and it's gonna make it hard for roundworms to find a home. So they will clean themselves out that way and in a small way, it's not gonna be like ivermectin. It won't be like a pharmaceutical dewormer, but um, it, you will get some good out of that. It'll reduce their parasite load somewhat. The other thing is, is if they're living in a clean environment, um, they will uh, have a lower pathogen load, a lower parasite load than if they live in a dirty environment. And as a result, will gain weight faster. And lastly, um, rotationally grazing pigs, and this is somewhat anecdotal. I don't know the scientific way to explain it but rotational grazing pigs from one paddock to the next um, puts a little sparkle in their eye. A pig living in an extremely dirty environment, in my mind, seems somewhat lethargic, somewhat of having a flat spirit, and as a result, doesn't eat its dinner with great enthusiasm. So uh, these pigs who are living like this, they'll probably have um, a little sparkle in their eye and I don't know how to quantify it, but that's gotta be good for him somehow. <laughs> uh, any questions, Steve, before I roll on? Uh, there was a question about stocking rate, mm -hmm. um, you know, stocking per rate. age of pigs, maybe with sows and piglets or feeders to finish. Um, I'm gonna have to get back to you on that one. I, 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 have that, uh, I have that written down somewhere, but I don't have that number committed to memory. Um, okay. But I can say that um, if we're using um, a full 1,320 foot geared reel, that we can get 50 pigs in there, uh, no problem, uh, leading right up to finishing. Uh, we may need a little bit more space or, or to, uh, I mean, depending on what the weather is doing and what they're standing on, we may need to rotate them a little bit quicker. Um, but you know, I, 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 like, I like a reasonably high stocking rate actually. If I had my choice, I'd have a high stocking rate and then I'd move them more frequently. Um, that's a very general answer, but that's, I can't remember the numbers off the top of my head. Um, okay, moving on to the next slide. Okay, various strategies that we have tried to limit grain. This long list there on the right. Uh, this picture on the, on the left, um, this is 2013 or 14, kind of a small, you know, I, I don't know, half acre sweet corn field. We picked all the sweet corn, sold it at a farmer's market. Um, whatever was left, whatever was overripe, uh, we sent the pigs in. So we, you can see there's a waterer. And uh, this particular group of pigs, they ate it all down to the ground. They ate the, um, the overripe sweet corn, as you can imagine, and loved it. And then once they'd eaten all that, then they ate the corn stalks, and they loved that too. Um, so we've done rye, fall planted rye. We've grazed pigs in oak and hickory uh, forests and expected them to eat the nuts underneath. We've, um, we raised one group of pig on organic alfalfa baleage, you know, wet wrapped in plastic and whey. We've uh, done a lot with um, clover and winter squash. You know, day after Halloween, you can, uh, you can, you can get an awful lot of pumpkins for almost free. Um, and that, that stores pretty well. We've done a lot with clover and apples, done a sorghum Sudan grass. And then as the protein supplement, we gave a soaked soybean meal. Uh, we've done whole milk and vegetables. <coughs> uh, it doesn't matter a lot what the vegetable is other than spicy chili peppers, garlic and onions. They don't want anything to do with, um, cucumbers and, um, and green beans are pretty, pretty, you know, second tier but sweet peppers, tomatoes, uh, sweet corn, watermelons, cantaloupe, uh, zucchini, 
you know, there's, there's an awful lot of stuff that is getting thrown out at farmer's markets. And if they'll bring it to you, you know, and you give them a pound of sausage or something, if, if they'll bring it to you and you can just dump it right into the field, that's great. Um, I, I would say, and we may get to this later, but I don't recommend driving great distances to get free uh, rotten watermelons. Um, I don't think that pays off in the end. I, I think the opportunity cost is, is higher than what your time is worth. Um, pea vines, we've done a lot with planting pea vines. And then my very favorite, and we'll see more pictures of this later, is uh, a spring planting of forage oats. Forage oats just don't head out for a long time. Uh, forage kale turnips and peas. Um, the only thing I revised about this whole thing is that um, I have not found pigs that like to eat the turnip bulb. Um, that's why we transitioned to kale. Uh, now we just do oats, kale, and peas. And the, um, the turnips was a wasted effort. They, they leave the turnip on the ground and just eat the green top off. Um, so we've tried all of these things. Uh, we're gonna about to get into some data that, I'm ta that I've taken. Uh, pretty soon, but not quite yet. Uh, these pigs are uh, living in an apple orchard. I add this, uh, it's a cautionary tale. Um, this is not good for apple trees. <laughs> um, don't do this to your orchard. Um, uh, they will knock trees over to get the apples. They'll climb the trees to get the apples. They'll get itchy and they'll rub their behinds on the trees until they fall over. They'll eat the bark off the trees. Um, that's one cautionary tale. You also see over here on the left, this was, this was picture was taken a long time ago. Um, we've got three hot wires up and that's, that's two hot wires too many. I wasted a lot of time putting up those second and third hot wires. They only need one. These, this group of pigs is big enough to know. Uh, it's a good looking group of pigs, but they should know one hot wire is enough. Here goes the next Okay, this is still on the idea of when pasture is limited. And what I'm trying to scare people off from is I don't want people to think that, um, that pigs will eat grass like a sheep and will gain weight and you'll make money. Um, it is a little bit tighter bullseye than that. So in this picture, what's going on is we have gone out, we've gotten apples, uh, we go to an orchard, we pick them for, we get them for free. We would go to an orchard after they had, you know, you pick orchard after they'd gotten a big going over. And then we put tarps under the trees and shake them. <coughs> and then we pick up the tarps and put those um, into barrels in a trailer. And then we try to bring 12 barrels home. And that would last us, you know, a week. So these are some really great looking pigs. Um, and they're living on apples and the tiny bit of clover that you can't really see in the picture at the back of the pen. And, um, and then we'd soak soybean meal. And we soaked it because um, as a dusty ground grain, it's pretty easy for them to spill it out of their mouths or dump it out of their feeders. But if we soak it, it adheres to itself a little bit better. And then they, we feel they consume it better. So um, apples represent the carbohydrate component. Uh, roasted non-GMO soybean meal represents the protein. Um, we also would uh, have a little bit of um, mineral added into that. Uh, in this particular picture, uh, apparently I'm saying the, the pasture accounts for no nutrition at all. But like I said earlier, um, they are going to do way better um, outdoor like this than just um, on, a, on a flat, you know, muddy ground. Um, they'll drop their droppings, the grass will grow better next year, we'll rotate them off, they'll be on clean ground again on the next, the next uh, Friday, and life will be good for them. Okay, uh, red clover. This, this, as you can tell, if we were bailing hay, would just be a little bit past prime. See the flowers are starting to go, go away. Um, we see a little bit of plantain in here. The grass is not returning, uh, which is okay. But just, just take a peek at this picture. You can see where the hot wire is in the background. Uh, we are growing clover as well as, as can be done, as far as I can tell. And this is before they grazed. This is after they grazed. That's before. That's seven days later. Think they got any nutrition out of that? That's enough that I saved money on a feed bill. They gained weight based on green vegetation. 
and you can see how much is how much they took. Um, I love these pictures. I like I can just go back and forth all day looking at these. This is success. Um, if you want your pigs to be high in omega threes, if you want to save money on the feed bill, this worked. Now I'm going to go back one here or two and say so you see all of these I cannot say with certainty that all of these did anything other than satisfy my curiosity this was all of these things these were part of my journey to understanding um, how to make money raising pigs and um, I did not take data on these so I do I advocate these these are fun homestead setting they would work great if you're a commercial pig farmer and you really, really intend to pay your bills based on selling pork, um, I am not guaranteeing that these will accomplish your goal. I will not guarantee that these will accomplish that goal. If you want to raise three pigs and have the most delicious, highest nutrition pork that, um, that exists, uh, this, I will guarantee that. All of these strategies will make that. Um, but bear that in mind, take that all, grain of salt, back to these pictures. I can attest that these pictures accomplished the goal of making money and creating a nutritionally dense superfood. How are we doing there, Steve? I think we're doing good. Okay. How are we doing time-wise? Since you've been uh, taking questions as we go, we're at uh, 7.54 our time, so okay. 30, 35 total minutes, but we don't need to stop at any point because you've Great. been taking questions as we go. Great. Okay. Organic plant, fall planted cereal rye just passed its prime um, on the on window of grazing for pigs. I don't know much about cows. Maybe if we'd been here a week before, we would have got an incredible graze for cows. I, I'm not a cow guy, so I don't really know. But... Um, what I intend to do with fields like this is I intend to roller crimper these fields and then plant something else into them. In that case, I will have my bedding on the ground. I'll be suppressing weeds. I'll be holding soil moisture. I'll be protecting the microorganisms, the soil biology that are doing the heavy lifting in terms of soil building. I'll be protecting all of them um, and then there will be something else coming up through there. So my definition of sustainability has generally been um, not strictly an environmental sense, but it's also logistical and financial. How much good can we get from a single action? If we're prioritizing actions for efficiency and goals, um, I like to think sustainability has something to do with getting the most benefit from a single action. and in this case, a fall planted crop of cereal rye. I love rye. I love to grow rye. Um, the cereal rye does that pretty well. We might be getting six or eight different jobs done from a single action. And that makes me feel like I moved a step closer to sustainability. Um, moving on to the next slide. This is a primo cover crop mixture. This is the sort of thing that's usually intended for... Uh, dairy cows, I'm told. I'm not a dairy cow guy either. but uh, And this is my favorite mixture for springtime planting. Um, this is um, a forage oats, a forage brassica. Brassica is the kale. And a forage pea, all mixed together. And I'm sure you've all heard it before, but all these different things in certain areas of the field, one species does better than the other. And that's better than a blank spot. That's better than a bare spot or a thin spot. Uh, in certain weather uh, patterns, you know, if it's dry or if it's wet or if it's cool or if it's hot, each one of these things fares a little bit differently. So this is a three-way cross, um, and you can tell the functional family groups is there is a, uh, a legume, there is a grass, and there's a broadleaf. These are all cool season. We could have a functional family group for a warm season also. And uh, the stuff that I'm seeing from Gay Brown, Rayard Chaletta, Alan Williams, that seems to say that uh, the cooperation of all these different functional families and plant types uh, seems to kind of reach a plateau around seven or eight species. So, you know, while my springtime 
grazing mixtures have had these three uh, functional types represented. Um, I'm, I'm going to move on to seven or eight species this upcoming year. Um, it'll be the same functional groups. There will be uh, a broadleaf brassic. There will be a forb, a grass, and a legume. Um, but I might have several of each. In this case, I've got oats. Then I might have barley and oats. Um, but this is another, just like, I'm going to scroll back here real quick. Just like this picture, that's all this beautiful clover. Um, I can also say that this sort of mixture, uh, pigs will graze this and gain weight. This is a close-up of it. Um, you know, just imagine a pig going through there. Man, it's like living in a salad bar. They're going to eat that. They'll gain weight, and, um, and they'll love it. You can reduce your feed bill with something like this. Um, okay, so now we're going to talk uh, briefly about fatty acid profiles. So, um, you know, when we're marketing to the masses, and the masses – don't necessarily mean that we're selling to Walmart or anything, but it means the group of people that you meet at your farmer's market or restaurant or wholesale buying club, wherever your venue is for selling. Um, the way people are thinking, you know, particularly about grass fed beef, they'll think what's in it for me. You know, that's one of the greatest drivers in the grass fed beef movement is all the data showing that grass fed beef makes you a healthier person. Um, we're tr trying to show that there's a similar amount of data possible to accumulate on pasture-raised pork. Um, it's not, a, you know, the statistics are not as dramatic as grass-fed beef, but, you know, every little bit helps. So um, what I've got right here is uh, you can see that it's divided into two sections. The left three vertical columns are my experimental groups from 2017. We did a full grain group, full grain meaning all the corn they could eat, rotationally grazed on pasture also. Then we move on to a 50% reduced grain group. Uh, this means that there's a group of pig, we moved the brake wire every day, um, we reduced their grain consumption by 50% what was prescribed by in the literature that we can read, and uh, we grazed them on a uh, on a great lineup. It's called a successional relay of forage crops. It's the grass-fed dairy guys and beef guys probably know more about that than I do. But this particular year, we were just really lucky. You know, we did a spring planting, an early summer, and a late summer planting. Just nailed all of them. Uh, we got really lucky with weather, really lucky with timing. And uh, we, we, never, we never missed a beat. We moved out of our spring planting and straight into our early summer planting. We moved out of our early summer and into our, into our late summer planting. Um, it, it worked like, you know, worked like magic. And then our most radical departure uh, from the conventional way of thinking was a no grain group. We did not give these pigs any grain whatsoever. Um, meaning we didn't give them any purchased grain. They could, I don't know, did they find some grass seeds to eat? <clears throat> did they uh, eat some peas or some oats off the spring mix? They probably did. So I don't know if we can legitimately call them no grain whatsoever, but we certainly didn't buy any grain for them. Um, and I don't think that they got very much kind of secondhand grain, if you will. Um, so that's, that's my experiment groups. Then we're going to move down to the, to the right three. Polyface Farm, dear old Joel Salatin, uh, I asked him for a pork chop, and he gave me one. Um, Stirring Soil Farm, I, I'm not uh, intimately familiar with these guys, but I ended up meeting them at a Mother Earth trade show um, that we were speaking at, and they were just doing some great things, grazing cover crops and, and feeding vegetables to pigs and whatnot. So I said, well, let's, let's, get, uh, let's get you guys in the, in the mix. And then... Uh, much as I hated to do it, went to Walmart and bought a pork chop. So um, I am not a scientist in the formal sense. I'll have a hard time explaining anything other than the bottom line. So if everybody looks at the, the N6 to N3, what that's meaning to say is the omega-6 to omega-3 ratio. So moving across the bottom line, 
the um, lower the number, the better. We, I'm told in an ancestral sense, we might have consumed an omega-6 to omega-3 ratio of one to one. Um, I think that the modern American diet is something like one to 60, or I, that's probably wrong, but it's something outlandishly out of balance. That's the take home message though. Modern American diet is excessively heavy on omega-6s. Um, so let's just go down those numbers. In fact, let's start at the far right. So we've got a baseline. So 99% of the pork in America um, was raised like this, probably never saw daylight, lived exclusively on genetically modified corn and soybeans, um, heavy quantity of antibiotics in their life. Store-bought bottom right bar, 29.4. Um, that's a pretty high number. And what that's showing is for every one omega-3 um, unit, there's almost 30 omega-6s. We would say this is a 1 to 29.4, nearly 1 to 30. Um, okay, now we're going to move to the left. Stirring soil farm. Look at that difference. That's a 1 to 8. Let's move right back over here. 1 to 29. Holy cow! Would you look at that? That is a enormous difference. This, these guys are grazing pigs on cover crops. And we get down to Joel, okay? Uh, Joel is grazing his pigs on, um, and bear in mind, all of these pigs, the only pigs that didn't get any grain is the no-grainers. So um, stirring soil, they're feeding their pigs grain. Joel's giving them grain. I'm giving my pigs grain, all except for this crazy no-grain group. Um, so, so Joel's got a pretty good number, 13.22. Uh, to one, right? That's 13.22 uh, omega-6s for every one omega-3. And that is, you know, more than twice as good as the store-bought ratio. So um, now fast forward whoop, way over here to my full grain group. My full grain group is just ever so slightly worse than Joel's, okay? Uh, the lower number, the better. Mine's 13.84. What do we learn from this? This is one of the more fascinating elements of this particular study that we raised, is that you can give a pig unlimited corn, you know, non-GMO, of course, that's the way we do things. Um, you can give a pig unlimited corn, and if you move them around green grassy pasture uh, once a week, like I was doing with my full grain, like Joel was doing with his, his full grain, uh, you can drastically improve the omega-3 to omega-6 ratio. Now, we take that backwards to what we saw with grass-fed beef. You know, one of the big reasons that people buy grass-fed beef is the perceived health benefit, which is the real deal. Um, that's one of the reasons, maybe the biggest reason. Now we look at the, the cash statistics, $4 million to $400 million. There is a ton of opportunity to capitalize on these numbers that I'm pointing my uh, little pointer here to. Um, if you can show people that they are going to benefit from consuming your product, and we do this in a non-salesy way, but just in a simple education way, you can do that using mm, social media sites, Instagram, Facebook, you know, there's a million ways to get people to know it, do tabling, go to your grocery store, really, you know, be disciplined and, and do this as a, as a job, um, as, a, as a career, then um, we should be leveraging this push point. We should be levering this driver, leveraging this driver to create our perceived value among our customers. Really super important to anybody who wants a paycheck. Um, okay, so what we've just seen is that you don't have to do anything crazy in order to get 100%, 120% better than Walmart pork chops, okay? Don't have to do anything totally crazy. Put the pigs out on well-managed green grass, give them all the corn they can eat, move them every Friday, bang. There you are, 120% better, roughly. Okay, now let's start dipping into the world of crazy talk. Rainbows and unicorns here. 50% uh, grain reduced ration, moving the brake wire, uh, you know, every day, 
zero grain. These guys, these guys were grazing side by side. There was a break line in between them. These were two different groups. The no grain group was one group, 50% group that reduced is another group. They're both side by side, a single hot wire between them, both grazing the same successional relay uh, cover crop mixtures. Difference being these pigs got half the grain they needed. These pigs got no grain whatsoever, but we gave them a pint of organic dry milk powder morning and evening. Um, does that make sense, Steve? Could you, could you follow that explanation? Yeah, yep. Okay. Um, before we move on from this slide though, we've got a question, but I'll let you finish this thought. Yeah, okay. So um, anyway, that's, uh, that's the difference between all of it. Um, that's the difference between all of it. Um, yeah, let's go for that question. Okay, so um, we had here, you did mention specifically that you're not a scientist, so I'm not sure if you have the answer for this, but there was a question about um, for that, uh, the ratio omega-6 to omega-3 ratio. Yeah. Do you know what the variability or standard deviation was or the number of uh, reps for the, for the study? Yes, I do. I think we're gonna see that in another, in okay. another slide. Um, the uh, full grain group uh, was about 50 pigs. The 50% reduced was eight pigs. Nine gr no grain group is nine pigs. And then um, all the rest of them was a single sample. So Polyface Farm, a single set of pork chops. Stirring Soil, single set of pork chops. Store-bought, single set of pork chops. Yep, okay. Um, and, and then also there was, there was a handful of questions that came in just before you got to this slide on pasture mixes, the species. Oh, great. So I don't, we can wait, you know. Yeah, let's we've go got, for them. We've got 20 minutes left, but okay. So here we go. Let's see if I can find where we start. Um, so a little bit earlier on, there was a question that, that you, you had said um, something that prompted this. If grazing pigs doesn't su substantially reduce the need for feed, which was your first list of all of those different inputs, um, and then, then the question is, what and how are you feeding the pigs in the pasture? And then you went on to your red clover slide. So c yep. there were some questions to clarify that. Um, yeah, is, great. Is good, red good clover question. the best? Is red clover the best or is it a mix? What was the, what is the, the takeaway from that? Uh, I am just as opportunistic as my pigs. <laughs> uh, so whatever the most low effort, the easiest, the greatest bang for your buck, um, you know, biological resource for getting them fed, I, I, that's probably what I'm going to go for. So uh, that's one, one question. Uh, another question being, if the pigs aren't getting a ton of benefit, and I can, I can go backwards to that long list. Just give me just a second here. Um, almost there. Okay. If they're not getting a ton of benefit from that list, what are they eating? And um, so I did many of these things I did thinking that they were going to get a ton of benefit. And some of them uh, went, went pretty well. I just didn't gather data. You know, some of this stuff I was doing, I was just doing just to do it. You know, the clover and winter squash, for example, man, they, they, you know, some of these things, I wasn't giving them any other grain. Um, so they must have been benefiting, you know, somewhat from it. I just wasn't measuring it. So since I wasn't measuring it, um, that's where my can't really guarantee. I don't know what it did. Um, in some of the instances where, let me show you this picture. Um, so in this picture, they're living on apples and soybean meal and other situations where we didn't have, or if, let's say I just didn't have time to go get the apples. Uh, to go gather the apples. In, in those situations, when they don't have much uh, green forage in the field, then we would just be bringing out a wagon load of non-GMO pig feed, just corn and soybean, non-GMO corn and soybean meal, basically. Uh, so yeah, we, in that sense, in it's situation, we'd be bringing grain to the pigs while we moved them around pasture. Uh, you know, sometimes Mother Nature is so fickle that whether you have a pasture-raised pig or whether you have a grazing pig, 
it's just going to depend a little bit on on your good luck and and what mother nature gives you you know uh, we'll we'll sometimes we'll take pigs and they'll just be grazing along great we'll get to the end of one of their you know fields we won't have any more uh forage for them and i don't have time to go gather up apples so what do we do we order grain uh that's what we do i guess Yep. Okay. And um, then just past this slide here, there was um, uh, some other clarifying questions. So you, you mentioned your primo mix is oats, mm -hmm. kale, and pea. Mm -hmm. So i um, wondering about the ratio with those three that, that works best or that the pigs like, like most. And someone else asked about the seeding rate for that. Okay. Um, I don't remember the ratio other than uh, brassicas are really, really light. Um, if someone is interested in trying something like this, um, I would recommend, you know, really getting good advice from a seed dealer. Um, you know, whoever you're buying your seed from, they'll, they'll have some, they'll have better advice than I will. I, I can't remember how I, how I seeded this particular rate. Um, I will say that um, in terms of varieties, I use uh, forage varieties and what was the other question well it was uh the seeding rate for the oat kale and pea or or you know with that ratio what's the best you know what works best what are they like yeah, the best? No, I, I i i just followed the uh seed dealer's recommendation and you know a lot of the stuff we did broadcasting style rather than drilling uh -huh. um so i whenever i do that i increase the um the seeding rate by maybe 15 or 20 percent okay uh, if that if that helps but I, sure. I can't remember the exact details i think i think people are better off talking to a seed dealer and getting getting those numbers okay and another related question to that then is why oats rather than spring barley wheat or forage triticale have you thought about those yeah i would love to try some of those things um you know uh when we started on the oats um uh, that was just what people were planting real early in my area. So we just kind of, you know, sometimes that's what happens. You just see what all the old timers are doing and, and think, well, there must be a little bit of wisdom there. You know, maybe there's room for improvement also, but there's, there's probably also some wisdom there. And, and that, that's why we picked, um, that's why we picked oats. But I would think that those other things, um, would have, you know, equal merit also. Okay. And then the, another question before I let you move on is um, while we're on diet here a little bit, any thoughts about providing lysine? Uh, Absolutely. Yep. Absolutely. So lysine, uh, apparently somebody else catches this, that lysine is the first limiting amino acid in pork production. And that's very, very short in short supply on pasture. Um, so, Sometimes um, we would go on to um, the soaked uh, soybean meal uh, to serve as, um, as a uh, vehicle for getting lysine into the pig. Uh, sometimes we would use various stages of dairy, you know, from whey, you know, from a cheese house to a whole milk from our Amish neighbors who didn't need it um, to um, this dry milk powder that we tried in 2017. And uh, that was all of those things came after we realized um, that uh, that you know lysine was so important. All, we read several studies about that. Uh, before that, we just didn't know, you know. So I saw a Joel Salatin movie where at the very end, you know, the truck driver says, "Well, you uh, you get to the party when you show up." <laughs> and um, I took that to mean, well, sometimes you got a lot more enthusiasm for a project than you have knowledge, and that uh that kind of sums up my my start into the world of grazing pigs I, a lot of enthusiasm not very much knowledge and in in lacking that knowledge uh i went ahead and tried stuff anyway made mistakes and probably some of my pigs didn't gain weight as quickly as they could have um but that's the uh that's the path to knowledge the path to education sometimes is uh it's a little bit expensive that way yeah and i bet they were happy all the way through too yeah, yeah, probably. Um, okay, so let me see here if we got any other questions I want to get you on. Okay, I think there was a couple of questions about um, the the breeds that you think are, would be better for pasture 
okay. or not, if that's something you want to cover. We've got about a little bit less than 15 minutes left, though, so we need to. Yep. Yep. Sounds great. Okay. okay so breeds, um, I think now this is going to be a hard statement to wrap people's heads around. But I think there's more um, variability within a breed than there is between breeds. So what I mean by that is you can find a Berkshire that's good at grazing, or you can find a Berkshire that's useless for grazing. Uh, same thing's probably true for Yorkshires and um, Red Waddles and Herefords, you know. <coughs> um, you, can, uh, you can find good ones and bad ones. You know, there's a lot of variation within a breed. So um, if, uh, if I was starting out and I was interested in trying to pasture pigs, for starters, I, I wouldn't try to get them to consume too much from pasture your first year. If you haven't had pigs before, you might just want to get three or four and, and see if you like having them around, I guess. Um, but uh, beyond that, um, for, for that sort of simple introduction, I would generally go to whatever, whatever you know, pig producer is reasonably close to you, get three or four. I'd probably worm them you know, right off the bat. Um, and uh, and give it a try. Um, but at present, my foundation stock is uh, large black um, that's been bred uh, to, it has a little bit of uh, Gloucester Old Spot mixed in. It's got some Hereford, it's got some Red Waddle mixed in, and it's got some, uh, some really old school Yorkshire mixed in. So large black foundation. Most of my pigs are black, but they, uh, their piglets are a great variety of different colors, <laughs> you know, from red to black and white spotted to black to black with white socks. They, they look like, you know, a little rainbow running around. Um, I will say this though, <clears throat> um, I sell pork and that's how I make my money. Um, so since I'm selling pork, I'm not selling fat and making my money. Um, so what that means is uh, the modern, the most modern pig breeds, the white factory farm pigs. I've heard so many horror stories about guys who, you know, live close to a big pig barn and one of them might be a little bit overstocked and they say, okay, hey, just come take 20 of these pigs off my hands. Um, you know, five bucks a pig or something. Uh, and he gets them, and that night he gets them out of their hot house, their temperature-controlled nursery, and the wind blows hard that night. He gets down to some, you know, 60 degrees. The wind blows hard, and they're all dead in the morning. Uh, so I avoid I avoid the factory farm genetics because they're um, they're not going to receive the same level of um, climate control. <clears throat> um, and then I also avoid the extremely old genetics. You know, the uh, American guinea hog, the Oswaba, the coon coon, um, you know, the mule hoof. They're, don't get me wrong, awesome pigs in there. And if your goal is to just graze, if you, if you want to limit grain consumption, a lot of those pigs are your way to go. But um, the reason that I avoid them is because uh, their genetics <clears> – <throat> has let them know that life is all about feast and famine. That there, nobody ever brought their ancestral genetics a bucket of corn. They sure didn't do it every day. Uh, so those pigs um, are gonna grow slower because they're trying to pace themselves. Uh, when food is present in abundance, their genetics is going to develop an, a fat layer. It's like a camel building its hump. It's preparing for the next famine which in you know, their ancestors' life was inevitable. The acorns will run out, and it will be a long time before the next batch of acorns falls. So they would you know, become quite fat. And um, I, I see that happening a lot to uh, some of these pigs is them, you know, when they are harvested, they're 60% you know, fat. Um, and you know, you know, a three-inch fat layer around a two-inch pork chop you know, something like that. So um, 
that's the reason I don't raise them because I raise meat for a sausage and snack sticks and I, I don't have a market for fat. So I don't raise a lard type pig, um, but they can be definitely not putting down those breeds. Those breeds can be awesome, uh, but they don't fit into my uh, holistic context. Uh, so, you know, like I said, I, I go for the medium, uh, medium, uh, you know, scale back heritage breeds, you know, the, Herefords, Red Waddles, Large Blacks. Um, I've never had a Tamworth, but I'd like to. Um, that's how I pick them, I guess. All right, excellent. So just because of the time constraints here, John, let's get to that, uh, the okay. table of comparing the cost of production. Okay, here we I'll go, go yeah. through this pretty quick here. Uh, everybody see, we are comparing costs. Grain-free pigs, 50% reduced ration pigs, 100% grain pigs. These were the ones that ate all the corn they wanted and just rotationally grazed. So days of production, this is how long they were alive on my farm. 237, 234, those pigs were about the same age. These guys were a little bit younger. Um, grain consumption per pig, of course, zero grain got none. 50% reduced got 463. Um, not exactly 50%, but you know, whatever. 100%, uh, that's how much they got. Down here to feed costs. Now, this number is incredibly high. And if we think that through, it's because there was so much, uh, I had to buy so much um, organic milk powder to serve as a vehicle for lysine. So if someone else were to do this experiment and they already had their own dairy source, it doesn't matter what the dairy source is, there's a way to utilize it, whether it's whey or skim milk or clabbered milk or yogurt or butter, or, doesn't matter what it is. If you have a surplus dairy source, that's a really valuable resource, so long as you don't have to drive 200 miles to get it. Um, you can totally change this entire graph with, if you don't have to purchase your dairy stuff, your, your dairy supplement. You can do a grain-free pig for you know, a good competitive price point. I did not have that, that uh, resource, so I bought it. <clears throat> um, and then we'll just go across the board. Um, this, is, this is how much um, the feed cost for the 50% reduced. This is how much it costs for the 100% grain ration. So you notice these grain-free pigs, heck, I'm trying to do this to be a cheapo, try to save money. Look at this, you know, if I'm buying my, um, if I'm buying my dairy product, it's almost double what a full grain pig is. That's a, that's a, that was a real eye opener for me. Uh, harvest weights, we'll see that the grain free pig was actually a little bit better than the 50% reduced until we see that it was 35 days older. And that if they're gaining about a pound a day, that's a 35 pound difference. That's, you know, inside the wheelhouse there. They probably would have been about equal, really. Um, we see this, this animal's um, hanging weight was 270. These would have been, if they were the same age, they would have been relatively close. Uh, how much, this reading here says, how much does it cost to put one pound on the pigs? Um, $1.28 all because of the imported dairy that I had to buy organic dairy powder, uh, milk powder. Then we see for the reduced group, 48 cents. Oh my goodness, look at that difference. And then another big eye opener, uh, how much did it cost? It wasn't that dissimilar for the full grain. So the question is, did I, was it worth the extra work? And it's hard for me in this case to justify that unless we're pushing this like crazy, we're showing people, look at this number, right? This is, a, this is a great number. Can you convince your clientele that you're selling to that this number is worth two bucks a pound more than this number? I don't know if you can or not, but it's worth thinking about because that's, we, we're seeing here, we didn't save that much money. Did we increase the value to our customers to the point that we can um, we can ask for more money because that's that's what we're doing as farmers. We are selling our time, our expertise, and our land base. 
And we are selling that in the form of a story to people who don't have the time, the expertise, or the land base. And that's, that's part of our job. Um, okay, so down here to, oops, wrong way. Um, so day, average daily gain. Um, the grain free and the 50% reduced didn't, it's not that dissimilar. Um, over here to the 100% grain fed pigs, they, um, they gained more weight, but not a crazy amount more. Um, I found this whole thing to be pretty eye opening. And then this slide, um, you know, we're just seeing how did I come to those numbers? So grain free, there's no grain. There is some seed. I bought a little bit of salt for them because, you know, they have to have a little bit of salt. And then the supplemental feed cost, that's all milk powder. Look what their ration would be if you had your own dairy source and you didn't have to, you know, and you didn't have to drive 200 miles to get it. All of a sudden, you'd be right at $13 to produce a 212 pound pig. I hope that's an eye opener for somebody with a dairy <laughs> or living next to a cheese house. You know, all of a sudden you're, you're, um, you're spending $13 to produce a 212 pound carcass instead of 150 on grain. So there's a certain place where the graph all comes together, you know, and the graph on this is going to be how many pigs do you need to raise to make it worth it? Uh, what is the abundance of the resource base at hand, whether it's whey or, um, or pumpkins? You know what I mean? Can, uh, can you raise enough pigs, whether to be a commercial operation or to be um, a hobby? You know, a hobby, hobby is great. We all, we all have to have a hobby. You know, a lot of hobbies are real expensive. You know, uh, if you make a little bit of money at your hobby, you know, fully for you. That's great. Um, so if you want to raise 12 pigs a year and you've got a neighbor with a tractor and a, and a no-till drill or some kind of drill and you've got somebody else who has a, who has a cheese house, um, it might work out. It might work out the best thing ever. I don't know. It, you may also find that it takes several tries to hit this target. Um, I don't expect it to go seamlessly on the first try. Just like learning to play basketball. You know, you got to practice basketball a pretty long time before you're in the NBA. Uh, you got to practice farming. You know, if you're a first generation farmer, you got to do a lot of practice, talk to a lot of old crusty men in bib overalls <laughs> before, you, uh, before you learn all the tricks. Um, hey, John. So yes. Um, there was a question on that table two there, if you can go, if you don't mind going back to that. Um, question about why, so looking at that 50% reduced grain, it took 202 days of production to reach that harvest live weight of 189. Why did you stop there? You know, why, why did you harvest at fewer days when it was also a lower live harvest weight? <laughs> this is this is a not very good answer. I don't remember why I did that. Um, at the time, I had some reason, and I it this was in, gosh, this is at the end of 2017. Um, there was some circumstance that seemed to dictate that, and I don't remember what it was. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, whoever asked that question. Good question. I'm glad you caught that, but I wish I had <laughs> a better answer for you. Yeah. Uh, any more? Yeah, so uh, there was also a little bit more about the uh, uh, balancing the rations between grains and pasture. How did you, um, well, well, first of all, let's see, how long, there was one question here specifically, how long do you graze the super spring mix? I think they're referring to that primo mix, oats, kale, and pea. Yeah. When did you start grazing after planting, and then when did you quit and move to something better adapted to summer temperatures? Yeah, so um, I've done that two or three times. Uh, I typically intend to plant on March 21st, and then I intend to start grazing um, on May 15th. Uh, and then we can, it, it, a lot of it depends on your holistic goals, your context. Um, do you want to go for maximum efficiency or um, are you doing something else with your life? <laughs> you know, is, is there, you have other goals aside from, aside from this uh, pig project. So I think that I grazed up through, I think I got six weeks out of it. Um, I definitely started before 
it was perfect. You know, I started while it was still fairly small. And then I pushed it until uh, the pigs were eating peas off of brown, crispy vines. Um, and that was by um, end of July, first week of August, and that's in North Missouri. Um, so what that would mean is that if you are gonna move the pigs off uh, on July 25th of your spring planting, um, you'd need to have, uh, <clears throat> in this case I did, uh, Sorghum Sudan. Uh, it was a dwarf BMR Sorghum Sudan along with a uh, Red Ripper climbing cowpea. And if I did it again, I'd use a heat tolerant brassica and I'd just load it up, you know, get seven or eight things in there. And, uh, and, and, you know, but you'd have to plant that, you know, 45 days earlier than, than what you wanted to turn them in at. Was that the answer to the question? Oops, sorry, I forgot my mic was on mute. I think so, though, yeah. Okay. Um, and so we already are past time here. I f I'd say let's just, uh, yeah, it looks like they did say you did answer the question, so thank you. Okay. Um, yeah, all right, I think we can move on then. Okay, great. So not a ton more to say here. I mean, there's we could talk about this for the next three weeks if we wanted to, but um, I'd like to direct everybody to uh, Sugar Mountain Farm in Vermont, their website. Um, Walter Jeffries uh, runs it and he, um, you know, just has an awfully lot of information on, on the internet, uh, whether it's blog posts or whatever you can, you can learn more that way. Um, he, he feeds, uh, enormous quantities of whey and enormous quantities of pasture and hay. And, um, and that's great, you know, more power to him. I, I, I think he knows a lot about, uh, pigs and pasturing. Um, so that's that's something worth looking at. Uh, when we look into the future, um, what the way that I would like to see things going is I would like to use my human ingenuity uh, to hold hands with my watershed. Um, I would like to you know make friends with the earth in as great a capacity as our human minds allow us. And what that looks like to me, this was fall planted rye. Um, we have just roller crimpered it and are going to no-till drill into it. And um, if I can do that to produce some sort of crop that the pigs can graze, um, I feel fairly certain that I'll come out ahead. And uh, this, is a, this, is a real, this is a real emerging field that I would like to know more about. And uh, I don't know that much about it. And I don't know anybody else that does, really, other than, you know, you poke around on the internet, you can find something. Um, but this is a sort of thing that you have to practice a lot to get good at. And uh, we're not that good at it yet, but I, I intend to keep on trying and keep on s stepping up to the plate and swinging the bat and, and seeing if one day we, we do figure it out. Um, so I appreciate everyone, uh, everyone tuning in. Um, if, if I've done a good job presenting, then you all have more questions than when you started. <laughs> um, and uh, I, love to, I love to talk about it. Um, so I, I hope that we get a chance to do it all again and, and we can go on to the uh, Pasturing Pigs 2.0. And I uh, wish you all health, happy animals, food freedom. This is a beautiful pig named Sweetie Pie who escaped and gathered a large quantity of tomatoes and ate them all in front of me. <laughs> she was a great pig. Yeah, so. and... Um... Thanks so much, John. This is uh, chock full of all kinds of great information. Um, yeah, and one of the questions that just came up is, why the move from Missouri to Maine? Why now the move to Missouri from Maine? Yeah, now you're further away from us, so we can't. Yeah, I know. Can't sorry, sorry, I'm farther away. Mm -hmm. um, there were there was a, a number number of questions that that went into that. Our our kids were outgrowing the the private Christian school that we had them in. Um, it only went through eighth grade. Um, you know, my wife went to college out here in Maine, and she really loves the loves the water. You know, loves being close to the ocean. Part of it was a quality of life issue uh, for her. But yeah, we we had five or six kind of medium sized questions, and no no real big one in particular. Just lots of little reasons. Sure. 
Um, I will say real quick though that we do have um, research reports at practicalfarmers.org that outline a lot of on-farm research. John's report should be, uh, John's research should be on our website soon-ish. Um, I know there's also related to his last slide on crimping cover crops, we have a research report that uh, was done by Dave and Meg Schmidt here in Iowa on um, establishing summer annual cover crops after rolling cereal rye cover crops. So that uh, should be relevant for anybody who's interested in that topic as well. Um, and okay, John, so let's see, before we sign out here, um, you've mentioned pretty briefly before um, about having cows mm -hmm. at one point. And so I, I, um, we don't have time to get into all of that, but there was a question that said, what if any nutrition can be derived from cow manure if pigs are run behind the cattle, which I think is what you said you ran the kids, pigs behind the cattle. Especially, yeah. if it's, especially if the cattle feed is shelled corn. Do you, do you have any comment on nutritional value from that? Yeah, I, I don't know that much about it, and I've never done it. I've never, I've never tried it. Um, we run our pigs three weeks behind the cows. Um, so our intention <coughs> uh, is to have 40 beef cows graze through using, uh, I don't know, daily moves, moves every three days, you know, something like that. And then uh, we have 600 laying hens that follow the cows on a 72 hour cycle. So, you know, it's a couple days behind the cows, the chickens come in and then the intention there is to sanitize the pasture and remove the worm larvae uh, from the cow pies. Um, and that's 72 hours later. Then we'll wait uh, three weeks with the intention of letting uh, the clover grow back. And, uh, and then we'll graze pigs across that. So our pigs are not um, getting any benefit from cow manure. Um, you know, the, the old time literature, you talk to all the old timers, they'd, they'd say, uh, you know, keep the pigs in the pasture with the cows, one cow to every two pigs and let them be. You know, I, I know people who still do that. Um, so I, I can't say I've ever done it, but uh, if you want to give it a try, you know, that's up to you. Give her a go. <laughs> All right. Fantastic. So um, that that's a good time for us to wrap it up then because we finally got through the questions in the chat box, which everybody, thank you so much for tuning in and for um, asking really great detailed questions here in the chat box. Uh, we do appreciate that uh, interaction. And John, for thank you so much for taking the time to share your experience with us. I like how you started out too with how you're going to be presenting your experiences. They may sound like facts, but they're your experiences and that's what we want. So um, we really appreciate you tuning in and I know it's late out there on the East coast. So um, we appreciate the time you put into this. Yeah. Well, thank you, Steve. And thank you for all the uh, curious inquiring people out there. There's, there's nothing better than to be deeply curious about the world around us, you know, and finding some sense of awe and appreciation in it. So if everybody out there is just uh, keeps on being curious, then, uh, maybe we'll get somewhere good. That's fantastic words of wisdom. Thank you so much, yep. John. Thanks everybody for tuning in. Yep, thank you all, I'm signing out.